thank you very much um, also for the invitation of being able to talk here. I'm we're going to talk. I'm going to talk shortly about previous projects how I could use uh, Halldor Hermansson's works, um, and then <coughs> Regina is. Uh, and I'm going to introduce a project that we are working on now. And my part of the own project is for very interesting, not directly related to stuff that Halldor Hermansson did. So I'm going to talk about that very shortly, and then we are going to some. Regina is going to talk about her part of our project that is directly relevant and very interesting. So bear with me. So in my previous research, I've used mostly Halter Hermansson's printed catalogues that are, to my knowledge, the uh, only printed catalogues of the 16th and 17th century Icelandic printed books. And they are an indispensable source of information for me. So the detailed description that he made were truly outstanding for his time. Uh, and they served actually as a basis and a first information in several of my own projects and publications. And some of you who know me know that I'm very interested in title pages in both printed books and handwritten manuscripts. And the thing that I always go first to, this is actually Halter Hermansson's catalogues of the printed books of Iceland. Without those catalogues, my work would have been so much more difficult. So he really was a true man. I should perhaps also mention that um, the Fortnala Saga bibliography that was uh, published in the Islandica series served as a basis for my own Fortnala Saga bibliography that is online on the uh, Danish website. So here you have a couple of, uh, of stuff that I've published where I really had to use, like heavily rely on Halter Hermansson's catalogues. It's about title pages in manuscripts and in printed books. Um, and based on that, I actually found out that I am really, really interested in both manuscripts and books. And this is how we actually came about um, our new project, which is called Paper Trails. Um, and we actually have two parts and a case study. The first part is about paper history, that is my part. Then we have a case study about that family manuscript, and that is Thorin Girnatokis' part, who is also the project leader. And the part two is uh, about book history, and this is uh, where Regina Juknis comes in. We also work closely together with the new conservator at the Artnerstokne, Vasare Rastonis, and a very important co um, cooperation partner is the Landsfolk Assortment. There is a particular La Haltura and Ranver who work with us, and also um, a student helper, Jo. So thank you. Also thank you from Ranis for actually funding our project. So I now to the first part, <coughs> which is about paper history. So what I'm interested in is, um, the paper had to be imported in Iceland. There was no paper mill, there is still no paper mill, just uh, one recycling mill. So everything that is written in those post-medieval manuscripts and charges had to be imported. However, we do not know where it came from. Where was it produced? When was it produced? How did it come to Iceland? And this is uh, what I'm going to analyse and also going to analyze if there are differences between um, official people like the bishops and sislumen and uh, stiftsamtmen uh, in opposition to private citizens, to you know, any young bond who wanted to write up a manuscript. Like where did he, did he buy the paper from the same sources as the bishop did for his printing press, for example? That is stuff that we try to find out. Also, if there are differences in the paper for specific purposes, and I'm mostly talking about uh, paper that was used for printing and paper that was used for writing with ink and quill. So we are going to look at around 500 charters <coughs> from the 16th and 17th uh, centuries. We are going to look at uh, 350 manuscripts, like all paper manuscripts from the 16th centuries 16th century that are here in the Landsbokusart, in the uh, Stockman of the Magnusoner, and in the Danish Anemoniensky Samling. And 17th century, because we have a much more manuscript from that time, I'm going to focus only on folio manuscripts, because it's actually much easier, because watermarks are usually in the middle of the page and not hidden somewhere in the spine. So, a little bit easier. I'm going to use uh, watermark analysis. For the first time, I'm actually going to look at uh, with backlighting. So that means I have a light sheet. I put it light sheet behind. Mm, can you see that? Yeah. 
put it behind the page and then where the watermark is the page is actually brighter and this is how you see a watermark and you know that perhaps from uh, paper money Icelanders are not very good with paper money you use credit cards however if you ever go <laughs> somewhere else take you know, a sheet of money and hold it against the light and usually for security reasons you have a watermark in there. And in old paper you have that on actually almost every sheet of paper and it's used for um, a sort of trademark and also a mark of quality and you can use it perfectly for dating. So um, the watermarks that you see, they were used only in a very short period of time which is why we can actually use it so well for dating. Um, I'm going to have a German conservator coming up, taking infrared light pictures of watermarks, so we can actually put it into databases. And I'm also going to <coughs> analyze source materials such as charters, ledgers, um, customs books from Denmark, for example, everything where I might find information about the buying and selling of paper. So also inventories uh, and correspondence, for example, the Breda Beitbild, of some bishops where I hope to find some information on who bought and who sold that. Um, that information will be added to handrit.is and also to some uh, watermark databases that are online. And this is actually now where my colleague starts and talks about the second part which is more about book history. Uh, I brought as a book historian, I brought some books with me, which I would love to get back afterwards, if possible, uh, because they are not mine, they belong to the library at Cologne, uh, where the Icelandic collection is held that I am doing research on. Uh, one is a book in English, uh, which I love mostly uh, for its paratexts, so have a look at them. It's Keith Houston's The, the Book. And then a new uh, publication in German, which is called Biographien des Buches, which some of you might be interested in as well. Be interested in as well. I'll just turn them over. And um, this is also to be passed. This is our. Well, uh, when I teach, I always have some parts that is uh, promotion, and this is the promotion uh, paper for it. Just. It's at the table at the very end. You can, if you're interested ah. in having some flyer, more information about the project. Yeah, right. Uh, so, in fact, uh, from the paratext here, the title, you can see that I divided my part into, at least into two parts. It's part 2A and 2B that will come up. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, just as Sylvia did, I uh, put up uh, some statistics or some data about the, my part of the project. I am going to deal with 105 books with some 40 manuscripts from the 16th and 17th centuries, and uh, they are kept today in two repositories outside Iceland. That is at the British Library in London. It's from the uh, Sir Joseph Banks collections. Uh, collections, so there's some connections to other people here, and uh, from the University and City Library uh, in Cologne. Um, yes, originally we also thought to have a part on the Fisk Library, but then Christi Bragadov did uh, publish such a lot about this uh, collection that we are going to benefit from her work also to have uh, uh, her work and the collection, the Fisk collection in the middle because, you know, um, Banks collection is from the 18th century, Fisk from the 19th, and Erkes uh, at Cologne is from the 20th century. Um, yeah, the... How do you... Oh, yeah. What's not my better mouse? Sorry. Um, and the methods that I'm going to use in my research is uh, object autopsy, uh, bibliographical analysis that what touch was touched upon these days also, provenance research analysis of secondary sources just like Sylvia does. So trying to find some historical record for the things happening to the Icelandic books when they were left, uh, have left Iceland 
or some other destination. And what I'm trying to do is to write a single object biography or itinerary, it depends on the theoretical background, if you rather want to talk about the biography or about the itinerary of uh, an object. And then I will try to give a historical sketch of the distribution and transmission of Icelandic yeah. books uh, abroad. Um, as to the collection at Kellogg, there's another bearded guy uh, that you can <laughs> see here. <laughs> it's Heinrich Arkis. I hope that all of you already have heard of him, but I'm afraid you're not. Uh, um, he lived, uh, as you can see, uh, in the, mainly in the 20th century. He was a merchant and uh, he was part of the founders of the uh, German Icelandic uh, Friendship Society, what you call it. And uh, um, this guy, he had a great Icelandic collection, uh, which he negotiated to Cologne, uh, to the newly founded Cologne University and City Library. He first wanted to sell it, they wouldn't do that. Instead, he wrote them a letter with a recommendation for him to become a libra librarian there. Uh, and uh, giving his collection to them, and this sh they accepted, and he became a librarian there, uh, and catalogued his own collection. Uh, as you can see, for some numbers, it's forty, it's four thousand and five hundred ti Icelandic titles that he was, that he brought with him. Among them, three hundred and thirty prints from pre eighteen hundred, plus uh, um, prints of editions of old Icelandic texts that were not printed in Iceland, but as some of you know, in Sweden, mostly or in Denmark. Uh, there's one manuscript only, which I just want to, uh, to mention uh, from the 18th century, and today it's still a living, living collection. There's 13,000 titles that are kept there. Um, uh, I have brought um, one, uh, one example of the old prints that are kept there. Uh, Erkis, he tried to collect as uh, many old prints in every edition he could get, kind of parallel to what Fisk uh, was trying to do, although I think uh, um, from the record I can see that he was not as concentrated on well-kept and fine copies, but he, I think it, he took what he got. And uh, one example is a text that is very dear to Thor and Sigurd Dottir, it's uh, editions of <coughs> Johann Gerhard's Meditationis, uh, from 1606 that were translated into Icelandic. Uh, first edition came in 1630. And, flip here through, um, there came out uh, nine editions at Hola from 1630 to 1774, and the collection at Cologne houses six of these editions. Um, and I just uh, brought you some examples to just to tell you the story about what what story I want to tell <laughs> about the books. Uh, this is uh, the second edition from 1660, the oldest that is kept there, and there you can directly uh, see not that are not interested in the in the book and the text of the book itself, but in the paratext on the material that was used for the binding. Uh, and here you have a manuscript, uh, a, a fragment on one on one side, and on the left-hand side you can see something that I put here for you. It's an ownership mark, which is well, it's not a good picture. I took them myself, but it's dated and it's a name. It's Paul Magnussen who says that he owns this and that he bought it for some amount of shillings, uh, and then yes, yeah, dated and placed. Um, another example from just these editions is, for example, the use of uh, waste paper for the binding. And also on the left-hand side, you have a very sad fragment. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have uh, printed um, material that was used, which I have a little, oops. <laughs> um, and this is uh, also, oh, I, I am lying, it's this edition of 13.4. But uh, this is, uh, for the fun of it, a, um, you can maybe see that it's uh, the Ger a German, uh, what's it called in, 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 in English? Uh, Glaubensbekenntnis, uh, confession, confession of belief, mm, something. And it's in, uh, I think it's low German, and it's, you can see the woodcuts 
uh, on it as well. So this is kind of the material you could find there, as well as in a later, this is now the 60, 66, 1660 uh, edition. Uh, there's a manuscript fragment there, up there, and there's a letter uh, mm -hmm. where we have the name uh, Pietro Office, and as you can see, it's his mother in Signasgarth, and Signasgarth is uh, uh, named there. And unfortunately, the dating stops at uh, 21st of October 1. Well, he was there from, 19, uh, from 1819, so it would have been after, after that. And, um, well, this is uh, the part of the, the single object uh, history that I'm trying to write using the data that I can get from the, from the material that was used for the binding, uh, mainly. And um, the second part uh, is the cataloging. This is where maybe also Hotte Hammersmann might come in. Uh, I will try to catalog the book bindings of that corpus as good as well as I, I can. And uh, I will cat catalog single copies of printed books extant outside Iceland. And if you know uh, the bibliographies that were touched upon here quite frequently, the 16th and 17th century books, then you might also have noticed that um, Hardo Hermansson, he uh, tried to keep track of single, uh, single copies of the rare, uh, the rare books from that time. So this is what I'm trying to, I'm going to try to, um, to con continue the work of, of, of his. Uh, I got, just got <coughs> some, one example uh, from a binding there, and then it's, it's said that it's, uh, there is, you can't see it here because the light is so bad, but there's somewhere in the, uh, uh, on, the on the binding is stated that it's some, a name, no, Jonas, and that is called, and then it's said, Anno 1686. Uh, what you also can see here, hopefully, is that the um, binding was, uh, or the, the, the cover was reused. Uh, it was a far thicker book before, and now it, has, uh, it is around some prints that are uh, not as, as thick, all in all. And if you ever would be interested what kind of texts that are in there, it's a lot of forordning about uh, uh, different things. If you want to have a look uh, about the Latin school in Iceland, it's all from the, uh, from the 18th century, though, uh, about uh, tobacco and uh, alcohol and about uh, what, whatever, it's small, small prints that are bound together in this example. And now, uh, just before the end, I think time's probably already up, I don't know, uh, this <laughs> kind of cult of 520 that we're trying to do together with the uh, National Library here, this is uh, to add to Okaskrau, uh, which was shown in the morning, uh, and to a special uh, feature that uh, Jörg uh, left to me this, this morning. Yeah, you have seen that. You saw that in the morning that you can uh, uh, look up uh, uh, books and the X. Uh, it, this is where you can see where these books were published. And you also have the chance at something that's up there. It's called Boca Egg, which will tell you uh, who owned copies of old books or of books at all. And um, there, uh, I just put in the text that I has, had as a sample, the Fimtje Hela Höwekjur, this Johann Gerhard text. Uh, if you look at this, you can get a, a map where you can see uh, where, uh, where they have catalogued uh, extant copies in Iceland. This has been done before. But this, uh, this map can be expanded to the whole world, so we are going to try to, uh, to catalogue as many extant copies of these old Icelandic books abroad as well in this project. And I think this is about what I had to say. <laughs>